Hi, my name is Jam, and welcome to another Vishojo action figure review. Today we'll be looking at the Iron Curtain Trend Toys and Hasuki Link's Pulse Pocket Art Series Amelia, the first figure in this series, and she's numbered PA001. She released in November 2022 for 12,100 yen. Before we go any further, I want to say thank you to those of you who have subscribed. The channel's been getting more subscribers lately, so whether you are new or have been a subscriber for a while, I just want to say that I really appreciate you, and it's your support that keeps me going. Anyway, you may be familiar with Hasuki's other figure line called Seance Era, and those figures use a seamless body as their base. But here for the Pocket Art series, the figure uses a more traditional plastic body. What the two series have in common is the utilization of real cloth clothing, which is still a relatively new thing for figures of this scale, and seems to be a growing trend. The box for Amelia is reminiscent of a Figma box. In fact, it's the exact same depth as one, but it is a little bit taller and wider. As with the Figma box, there is a prominent window showing off the figure and accessories inside. The photo on the front, top, and bottom of the box are the same, showing Amelia fully decked out in her gear. The left side of the box shows her without her jacket, but still decked out, while the right side shows her with just her base outfit and gun. The back of the box predictably shows multiple photos of the figure and her various faceplates, plus a list of the contents in the box. Opening up the box, we see that everything is held in two layers of plastic trays. The top layer contains the figure and accessories, while the bottom layer contains the figure stand. The instructions are packed loose under the tray, and a grenade is in a baggie taped to the bottom of the lower tray. This is a good time to mention that the pre-order bonus was two of these grenades. The second one came separately in its own baggie outside of the box. Moving on to the figure, the head sculpt is an improvement over the head sculpt for Cerberus, which I criticize for being a little too plain, especially in the hair sculpt. Amelia has a much more complex hairstyle with bangs and a non-symmetrical bob, with the braid going through part of it. It certainly is more interesting, and the separation between the front and back parts of the hair is better hidden, though still obvious. Her angular face also looks good and manages to look decently unique and not too generic. The cheeks have a slightly chubby look to them, which helps keep her ever so slightly on the cute side, even when she's got her serious face on. Amelia also has a faceplate with a mask on, which is meant to be a filtration device and breathing apparatus for high altitudes and toxic environments. It's got an interesting shape resembling a bird's beak, and also has an auxiliary aiming system in the form of this monocle goggle. There's some good detail here, with the rivets along the edge of the beak and holes underneath for venting. Amelia's Soft Goods outfit has a multitude of layers and optional parts. Starting with her outerwear, she has a long overcoat in an army green color. It has a high collar and black synthetic leather shoulders along with integrated shoulder armor. The sleeves of the coat have large cuffs with black synthetic leather piping. A brass clasp helps keep the coat closed, but it can be undone by bending one of the tabs and sliding it out of one side. There are non-functioning breast pockets, and while the hip pockets are actual pockets, it's a bit hard to use them because of the way they are sewn. A wire runs along the bottom half of the coat to help sculpt it dynamically and lay realistically. A single snap button at the bottom rear of the coat allows you to fold back the lower left portion of the coat. A brown synthetic leather corset goes around the cloak to cinch it at the waist in order to create an appealing silhouette. It works just like a real corset would with a string at the back to tie in the corset. It looks good and does what it's supposed to do. If you want to remove it or the overcoat, you'll have to untie the string at the back. It's not super easy to get the string back on and tied, so make sure it's something you want to do before deciding to take it off. Under her overcoat is an outfit that's made up of three layers. You have the black outer part of the dress, and then underneath that is a white mesh undergarment with a ruffled white skirt, similar to a ballerina's tutu. This white mesh undergarment goes all the way up to partially cover the large opening at the front of the black outer dress. 
a white strapless sports bra type of thing, is in between these two layers and is the only thing keeping Amelia decent, and by design it's so small that cleavage and underboob is unavoidable. The dress is sewn at certain parts, but the edges aren't finished in the traditional manner and most edges are just folded under and glued down. The large opening at the front of the dress is the most worrisome to me as it only seems to have seared edges and parts of it are already looking like they could start to fray. Underneath these layers is nothing. She does not wear underwear, which kind of surprised me. I figured she'd at least have sculpted underwear like on Figma's, but nope, she is al natural down there. Amelia has a brown synthetic leather pouch strapped to her left thigh, and it's somewhat intricate in design with these triangular brass buckles. The pouch is non-functional, but it does look good. The elastic band helps keep it in place, but due to the smoothness of her leg, it tends to slide up or down. Amelia's brown stockings are made of a mesh material, and mine are non-symmetrical in length with the one on her right leg shorter than the other. They look non-symmetrical in the official photos, so I'm going to assume that this is how it's meant to be. Over the stocking, she wears white socks with gold studs, and over the socks are ankle leggings, which again have gold studs. I really dislike the use of these gold studs as they are glued on and they will fall off if you rub them the wrong way. I've already had one fall off of her socks, which is the worst place to put them due to the stretchy material. Something more permanent like a rivet or an eyelet that goes through the material would have been much more durable. The stockings and socks do not have feet since the figure does not have bare feet to go inside them. She wears black shoes with sculpted gold buckles and the block heels and soles are also gold. Once her overcoat is removed, you can add the optional outfit accessories. You get a pair of black sleeves that are meant to turn her black gloved hands into long gloves. You also get two belts, one with a brass buckle that's meant to be tight around her waist, and one with gold studs that is worn looser. They're both made of synthetic leather and are fully functional, so you'll have to get them through the loops and tighten them yourself, which can be difficult. The gold studs on this belt are the same as on the socks, and again, I really would have rather seen a more permanent embellishment here. And like the socks, I've already dislodged one of the studs and had to glue it back on. Lastly, you get an army green necktie that is attached to an elastic band, so you can put it around Amelia's neck. Due to the way it's made, it will just stick out perpendicular from her neck. You can help it to lay flat against her chest by tucking the narrower end of the necktie into her cleavage. Overall, I like the look of her outfit. I think the designers really thought out what will work best at this scale, not only for it to look properly in scale with the figure, but also to hide the articulation joints, since this is not a seamless body. It's an interesting style as well, and I can't help but feel reminded of World War I and World War II uniforms. Her outer coat very much reminds me of a great coat with its large collar while her necktie and ankle leggings remind me of World War II U.S. uniforms. Melia's mask is evocative of the gas masks that played a big part of the First World War, where chemical weapons were used extensively. These details combined with the more contemporary designs like her revealing dress and shoulder armor give her a retro-future aesthetic that you may find appealing, very much in line with the diesel-punk worlds of movies like Sucker Punch and Sky Captain and The World of Tomorrow. I should also mention that Amelia's outfit is not easy to remove, at least as far as her dress is concerned. It's very tight-fitting and tapers at the waist, and there's no way to loosen it. I gave it a shot by removing her head and arms in the hopes that I could pull the dress up enough to get it over the neck post. However, it's so tight that I felt that there was no way to remove it without damaging the dress in some way, and I really didn't want to do that, so I stopped. It's too bad too, because I really wanted to get a better look at her upper torso articulation, and I also wanted to try and swap clothes with Seance Era Cerberus. Oh well. While we've got her coat off, let's look at her articulation. She's got a ball-jointed neck on a dumbbell joint, which allows for some extra motion. 
The ball joint where her head attaches is a little loose on mine, but not loose enough to be completely floppy. Moving on, her shoulders are ball jointed for full rotation and can move forward and back slightly similar to a butterfly joint. They are also hinged so the arms can spread outwards. There is a figma-like bicep swivel that's part of her shoulder joint, so it doesn't offer full rotation due to the way the arm is designed to hide the joint. It doesn't matter too much though because her hinged elbow swivels quite well above the joint, giving you that lateral arm movement. The elbow has a good range of motion bending past 90 degrees. Her wrist joints are rather typical for this kind of figure, and can hinge 90 degrees and can swivel above and below the joint. Her upper torso is articulated, but it's hard to tell what the range of motion is like because her dress is so tight. She's got a ball joint at the waist, allowing her to tilt in any direction. Her legs are connected at the hips by ball joints, and while her sculpted bottom restricts her legs from swiveling back, she does have ample room to swivel her legs forward. She can also do the splits outward decently well. Her knee joints have an interesting design that gives it the range of motion you expect from a double hinged knee while looking more like a figma joint, with the added bonus of it not being round in the back. I don't recall seeing a joint like this before, but I think it looks good and functions well. Finally, her ankle joints are similar to the wrist joints, and they're hinged with swivel points above and below the joint. This allows for rotation and for pivoting the foot, though pivoting isn't as easy as it should be due to the angle that the peg is inserted into the foot. The angle is quite steep, so you've got to do a lot more swiveling to get the foot to pivot at the angle you desire. All in all, it's a good set of articulation points, and I feel like she's pretty flexible and can be put in a wide range of poses. Let's take this time to also talk about her base body. As I mentioned earlier, Amelia uses a more traditional base body as opposed to the seamless bodies found in Hasuki's Seance Era line. I believe the body here will be reused with future Pocket Art series figures, similar to how a lot of 1-6 scale figures reuse base bodies or bucks as they're sometimes called. That's another reason I wanted to remove Amelia's clothing. If we're going to get this body with future figures, then I want to know how good it is. Despite not being able to fully remove her dress, I do get the feeling that this is a good base figure. I like the proportions, and the articulation is perfectly fine. The body is sort of anatomically correct, but the details at the privates and chest are more suggested instead of clearly defined. So it's not completely smooth like a Barbie doll, but it's also not detailed enough to look totally obscene. Anyway, as someone who used to collect a lot of 1-6 scale military figures, I think it's pretty cool to see this approach applied to Bishojo action figures. In the future, I hope to see customization options for these bodies, like different chest sizes or different legs to vary their height or hip size. Moving on, the diesel punk design for Amelia's outfit extends to the accessories she comes with. Her largest accessory is her jetpack, and it features retro detailing like large valves, rivets, and copper pipes. The two jet nozzles can swivel, and there are holes at the ends, so you could potentially add blast effects, but none are included. Her rifle is likewise in the same style, with a lot of tubing and extra plating attached to it to give it that advanced futuristic look, while still looking very industrial. It has a removable magazine, which fits very tightly, and the grip has an interesting knuckle guard, which makes it feel different from real-world guns, which is kind of cool, but it does make it harder to get her hand around the grip. Two bonus grenades are obviously inspired by German stick grenades used during World War I and World War II, and it's a nice little extra. A pouch or shoulder bag to help store them would have been cool, but even in the real world, soldiers would sometimes just stuff them under their belt. So you can do a similar thing here with this figure. The figure comes with a total of three pairs of hands, left and right black gloved grippy hands, a right-handed gloved hand for holding the gun, and a left-handed gripping hand for cradling the gun barrel or similar sized object and then you have a pair of ungloved open hands. 
Oddly, none of these hands hold the stick grenades very well. The wider gripping hand is too wide to grip the grenades properly, and the tighter gripping hands are too tight. The plastic used for these hands are much stiffer than they should be, but heating the hands should soften them enough to be able to hold the grenades. I also found the ungloved open hands to be incredibly difficult to attach to the wrist pegs. I had to heat them up in order to get them on. Conversely, the wide grip hand and gun gripping hand attached too loosely, most likely because they came attached to the figure. Asuki really needs to use a better plastic for these hands and or redesign the wrist pegs so they are easier to change yet also fit snugly. Besides the three face plates we've already talked about, you also get two front hair pieces. One is designed for when she is wearing the mask, and the other can be used when she isn't wearing it. It's almost imperceptible what the difference is, but the piece for the non-masked faces has slightly more hair covering her face. I almost forgot to mention her large triangular dagger. It's got a copper-colored handle with a handguard, and can be stored in a synthetic leather sheath that is strapped to her right ankle. It seems like an awkward place to put such a large dagger, but you can always move it further up her leg or remove it completely. The last accessory is the figure stand. It's composed of a six-sided clear base, which I find to be very similar to Bandai's action bases, with their multiple attachment points and ability to connect together once you have more bases. The included support arm is composed of four sections, so it's more articulated than a Figma stand, for instance. You can connect the figure to the arm using a traditional claw, or more interestingly, you can use a magnet. Yes, there is a magnet in the back of the figure instead of a peg hole like on Figma's. It's a cool idea in theory, as you don't need a peg hole, and the clothing doesn't need to account for the peg hole. However, in practice, it works, but just barely. The magnet does seem strong, but not quite strong enough. You can't use the magnet for jump kicks or any mid-air poses, as it's just not strong enough to support the figure. Also, if the feet start to slide out from under her, the figure can just fall over, since her weight can overpower the magnet. Despite that, I still think it's a cool idea, and I do use it to display her on my shelf, so I feel like it's good enough for regular standing poses and you can even do more dynamic poses as long as her feet are decently secure. I think Hasuki should have put a magnet in the jetpack as well, as you won't be able to use the magnet stand if she's wearing it. For those instances, you can use the claw attachment, which works well for regular poses, and even more dynamic poses. In any case, I'm just glad a decent figure stand is included. I really don't want to see any more foot stands for a while. I suppose I should also mention the included instructions. For the most part, it's pretty typical. Showing what's included, how to change the face plates, how to put on the jetpack, and how to use the stand. However, it was kind of cool to see a bit of lore added in the last section of the instructions. In the end, it's not a whole lot of info, but it does give a slightly better picture of who Amelia is, where she comes from, and who she is fighting for. Hopefully Hasuki will flesh out the backstories for these original characters even more in the future, especially if they all exist in the same universe and are fighting in the same war. In terms of paint, there's not a whole lot painted on the figure itself. Emilia's hair is painted, and I can't tell if there's any shading applied to it. I want to say there isn't, but there are a lot of angles and edges to catch the light and create shadows. The details on her face, such as the eyes, eyebrows, and mouth, are printed on, and they look really clean. Her body doesn't have any shading or paint on it, but I think it still looks fine. Her shoes are cleanly painted in black and gold, and I don't have any complaints there. Her accessories are really where we can see more interesting paint techniques. Starting with her jetpack, it's not only painted cleanly in metallic paints, but it's also got a sort of rust-colored paint wash that helps bring out details like rivets, bolts, and panel lines. Her rifle also has a clean metallic paint job, and there's a subtle silver dry brush application to help it look like it has worn edges and scratches. The brown stock also has some black streaks painted on it, which is supposed to replicate a wood grain pattern, but the end result isn't very convincing in my eyes. 
I appreciate the effort, though. Also, be careful with posing her with her gun. I found that the brown paint rubbed off onto my figure's arm, so try to avoid rubbing the gun against her bare arms. Her triangular dagger has a copper-colored grip, and the silver blade is weathered to look a bit dirty and worn. All in all, it's a perfectly adequate paint job on the figure and accessories. I haven't seen any paint flaws on my figure, but I did notice that the painted prototype in the official photos of Amelia show slightly different paint applications. The prototype shows fully painted faceplates with pink blush, but there's no blush on the final product. The prototype's stick grenades show a darker gray for the metal parts and a lighter brown for the wood handle, while on the final it's the opposite a lighter gray for the metal, and a darker brown for the handle. The cap on the bottom is also painted to look metal on the final product, which is a change for the better, as it better reflects the real-life stick grenade design. However, I still prefer the color choices of the prototype. Those are the biggest differences I spotted. I think there are also some differences in the weathering effects, but since those can be different figure to figure, it's harder to say for sure that those were changed from the prototype. Let me know in the comments if you spotted any other differences between the prototype and the production version. So how well does this figure fit in with other figures in or close to this scale? First let's measure her, and from shoes to top of head, she's 6 and 3 8 inches, which is about 162 millimeters. Not surprisingly, she actually fits in well with the Hasuki Lynx Pulse Cerberus figures, and they're roughly the same size, though Amelia does have heels on. The ball joint at the neck for these figures are actually pretty close in size, but unfortunately the Seance Era figures have an ever so slightly larger ball joint, which means the Amelia head can't go onto the Cerberus body without a little modification. However, the Cerberus head attaches pretty nicely to the Amelia body. Since both Seance Era and Pocket Art series figures feature cloth clothing, I imagine you can swap some clothing pretty easily. As I said earlier, I wanted to try that, but Amelia's dress is just too tight. But here's Cerberus with Amelia's overcoat and gun. I think she looks pretty awesome wearing it, don't you? So Amelia and Cerberus fit well together, but what about other figures? Here's Amelia with various Figmas, SH Figure Arts Chun Li, Mafex Spider Gwen, Marvel Legends Spider Gwen, Snail Shell Studios Tapigal Milk Tea Girl, Sosai Shoujo Tayen Madoka, Frame Arms Girl Durga One, and Storm Collectibles Tyrus Flare. I found that you could use hands from Figmas, Frame Arms Girls, and Megumi Device figures quite well but I couldn't find any heads that would swap easily, or at least without modifying the attachment point. Amelia's clothes should fit a decent range of figures, provided you can get them off Amelia, and the figure is thin enough to fit them. So overall, I feel like this is a good first step for the Pocket Art series. I like the concept of using a basic body with real cloth clothing that feels relatively in scale, Keeping clothes in scale for figures of this size is still a hurdle for many figure makers, but Hasuki is pretty good at it, if this and their other figures are any indication. Emilia's outfit is tight where it needs to be to keep her feminine form at the forefront of your mind, and it's been designed to smartly hide articulation points. It's not all perfect, of course, as there are chances that the cloth will fray, since some edges are not properly finished. The gold studs that are glued onto her socks and belt are also a negative in my eyes, and it's practically a guarantee that at least one of them will fall off with normal handling. It's also a shame that it's not easy to remove her outfit completely, since figures with cloth outfits beg to be customized and kitbashed. I can see why they didn't resort to velcro or buttons as they tend to bloat the outfit too much, so I guess we'll just have to see it as one of the sacrifices of having good-looking cloth outfits at this scale. The design of her outfit is a plus in my eyes. I'm not a huge fan of the bird-like gas mask, but overall I do like this diesel punk aesthetic, and I think she's got a decent set of accessories. I feel that her jetpack especially adds a lot of value to the figure. The included stand is also worthy of being mentioned because it's rather substantial, and I like that they're trying something new with the magnets. 
If you're a collector of 1-6 scale figures, you're going to feel pretty at home with this one. You'll be doing some futzing with her outfit to get it to look just right, but of course the benefit is that it's a real cloth outfit, and it looks great, especially considering the scale. Is she worth the price point of over a hundred dollars? In all honesty, my gut is saying no. I see the $150 price tag at a store like Big Bad Toy Store, and my thought is, no, I don't need this figure of a character I don't really know. That looks kind of cool. If you can get her for $100 or less, then I think that's more in the ballpark of what I think is reasonable for this figure. If you're really interested in the Pocket Art series, but think this figure is too expensive, then I recommend you take a look at the second figure in the series, which is a female ninja named Hagi, and her outfit is much less complex, which is reflected in her retail price of around 60 US dollars, which is so much easier to swallow. Well, that about wraps it up. This review took longer than I thought it would, and I found out I had a lot more to say about it than I thought I did. Every time I thought I was almost done, I would remember that I hadn't talked about this thing or that thing. Anyway, thank you for hanging in there and for listening this far. If you're interested in buying this figure, check my links in the description. As always, please like and subscribe if you haven't already, because it really helps me know that you like what I'm doing. And please let me know in the comments below if there's something I didn't talk about that you'd like to know. I love reading your comments. You're all awesome. Thank you once again, and I'll see you in the next review. Jam out.